Okay, thanks to everybody for taking time today to join um, Adam and I on our educational session. Um, I know everybody's busy, so we appreciate you setting time aside to learn about um, how our product and how our company and solution really helps transform IT um, in today's successful and competitive landscape. Everyone knows so many things are changing. I mean, literally every day things change so quickly. But one thing that's really become apparent is that organizations need to easily access, consume, and digest corporate-wide data and information. And IT leaders and departments are really expected to deploy programs that ultimately are going to deliver revenue growth, positive business outcomes, profitability, and innovation that delivers corporate growth. So this is new, right? Our IT organizations used to just deliver um, applications and um, architecture functionality for the company to be able to work effectively. But now they're really asking to come to the table um, with ideas and solutions for the company to be more profitable. So in today's session, um, we are going to discuss how simple it is to transform your IT department into a strategic business advantage with the help of our quick launch information engine and how simple it is to turn JD Edwards solution, which you all have, into one of your most valuable business assets. For those of you that are not familiar with our company, Preferred Strategies, we're the industry leader in delivering modern business intelligence data solutions to JD Edwards software users. Our mission is to successfully collaborate with our customers on implementation of our innovative quick launch information engine solution which then delivers near real-time access to your data via in-depth reports, analytics, graphs, charts, and dashboards to ultimately empower your business users and leaders to make strategic decisions. So uh, becoming data-driven allows you to use your data as an asset and really allows you to, at the end of the day, increase efficiency, reduce labor costs, and gain powerful insights into the future opportunities that can make you more competitive and more profitable. Um, a couple just housekeeping items before I hand the presentation off to Adam. Um, on the very right-hand side of your screen, you'll see that there's a question section. Um, throughout the presentation, as Adam's really walking through and talking about our solution and the benefits, feel free to type in your questions that you have. Then at the end, we'll leave some time We'll address the different questions um, and get you the answers that you need. Uh, so write those in there. I'll keep track of all those. We'll visit those at the end. Um, so for now, I'm going to hand it off to Adam. He's our president and founder of the company. He's going to really highlight and walk through the webinar for you. But also want to let you know that we're going to, um, in a second, going to get rid of our images just so that the presentation takes up the whole entire screen and that you can really look at what's important at this point. Awesome, thank you, Jill. And I just, before I turn off my camera, I wanna say hello in person, Adam Krieger, um, and we'll get started. So here we go. Okay, so um, a little bit about today, and, and I think Jill kind of covered the, the basis of, of kind of why we're here. Um, we have a, a few PowerPoint slides to walk through and then we'll get into doing a little bit of a, a hands-on demonstration today as well. Um, and please, uh, you know, there's a question panel and, and you know, feel free to, to put those questions in. We'll definitely tackle those at the end, um, but we'd love you know, everybody to come away with, with making sure they get um, answers to the questions that they have. And, and if we don't have answers, we'll, we'll track them down. <laughs> so um, a little bit about the agenda for today some high level considerations um, and just talk about just the, the the way that information is now being demanded today versus it was in, in years past. And just the challenges that we, we see IT facing day in, day out um, related to these. And then we'll do a live demonstration and come back for some questions. So uh, recently, just actually last Friday, Gartner, if you're not familiar with Gartner, they're a research analyst firm that, that analyzes a lot of different technologies. They have what they call a magic quadrant. They just came out with their annual report of the analytics and BI platforms. 
And um, you can see here on the left-hand side, the goal of this, if you're not familiar with it, you'll see that the one axis is ability to execute. The other is completeness of vision. And you wanna be as far to the right and as far up. And so you wanna be in the leader's quadrant and the far right corner of the leader's quadrant. Looking at this list, you can see Microsoft kind of sitting there furthest to the right and furthest up. So they're there um, primarily because of Power BI, but also because of their strategy as an organization as it relates to the BI platforms and analytics. Um, we are gonna be doing our demonstration and Quick Launch was built for Microsoft using the, the Power BI technologies. So companies that have, have, have picked that solution is where we align the best um, and we can, can kind of chat about. We do have the ability to kind of help support companies in these other applications on the screen, but our biggest um, contribution to success is for those with the Microsoft platform. Um, as it relates to just making IT a strategic asset just in general, if you are looking at bringing forward new analytics and reporting and BI technologies, these are the type of applications you probably should be looking at. There are some other smaller tier applications, homegrown or built for specific areas. Unfortunately, they're all pretty much gonna lack the ability to, to keep up with the leading edge technologies. So as an example, Microsoft comes out with monthly updates of Power BI. That's beneficial. So, you know, it's not just fixing bugs. There's new advanced analytics capabilities being served up on an ongoing basis. So this is just a real quick update as well. On the right, you'll see another analysis, Forrester Wave, um, and Microsoft also sitting in the leader in that as well. So we talk about a data journey, and, and so every company is a little bit unique in where they're at today and where they're looking to go. Um, if you're looking at making IT a strategic asset or making your data a strong and valuable business asset, you need to be considering what to do with that data and how can we leverage and make sure we're maximizing the use of that data in the decisions we make as a business to help contribute to you know, bottom line performance and increased improved efficiencies and just better visibility and transparency of, of our business. So we look on this and just a quick update, this slide you'll see at the bottom, there's IT driven, there's a ladder. We're gonna wanna move typically from an IT driven environment up to making and putting the power in the hands of users to more of an automated environment. So what we do is we notice that there's some different terms out there that you may have heard of reporting, right? BI and reporting has been around for decades, um, but a, a report, whether it's a crystal report or SSRS report or some other reporting application you're using, it's traditionally you'll see rows and columns of numbers on a page. And that could be one page or 50 pages, but in essence, it's just a lot of data, not necessarily prepared in a way to make people be able to make sense of that. So what the next step up in this ladder going to user driven is where the introduction of some of those technologies that were on that last slide like power bi or tableau click where now you can visualize that data take that you know the, the the very details of the data and start finding those outliers visually with trends and charts and so on and eventually what you want to do is is have the data work for you and that's where most customers are looking in the future to be able to mine the data and find some outliers and predict what may happen in the future. Um, not only when they may be able, over time be able to, to predict, but then also once that were to occur, what is the course of action to, to take once you know that um, that is to to happen. So this whole machine learning, you probably heard the term, um, and from a preferred strategy standpoint, we've got customers in all stages of this journey. Our goal is to be able to provide the framework to accelerate all customers using, let's say, JD Edwards um, or Salesforce, as an example, to, to move in, in this, this direction. So that's kind of the data maturity ladder or the different stages of the journey. This slide may make sense to some. What we still see quite often out there in the world is, you know, we call this kind of the great divide, the current state of reporting where you've got all these different data sources, but some key ones, let's say JD Edwards being a key 
data source, you've got reports coming from GD Edwards and maybe third party reports, like I mentioned, Crystal. Maybe you've got people joining SQL queries um, from other sources like Salesforce. Maybe there's an API connection. At the end of the day, what is the business doing? They are, you know, in essence, taking and just exporting the data or flowing that data directly into a spreadsheet via macro. So you've got what started out as, you know, one report turned into 50 reports, one spreadsheet turned into 50 plus what have you. And so now you've got this, this kind of challenge where on the right, you've got the business. Why is the business doing all this in Excel? Because that's what they know. Why is IT managing some of these things in the report? Because what, you know, that those require skills that aren't necessarily, you know, shared amongst all people in the business. So where are the decisions being made is the other question, right? Are the decisions being made by IT or the decisions being made by the business users that need to determine what course of action makes sense based on, you know, what, what their challenge are on that day. So, you know, you'll notice in this, you know, I would beg the question is, where does the business logic live, right? So if we're in this scenario, um, you know, who, who really in the business knows what IT, what's happening in some of those layers that's kind of hidden in some of the reports. And the same thing on the right, you know, who knows what's actually living in those spreadsheets? And where does the business logic, is that repeated? Is it actually certain calculations happening in all these spreadsheets? Regardless, there's a whole slew of challenges that this can, can surface and we could spend all day kind of talking about that the challenges of this, but this is really kind of becomes an unmanageable, um, you know, moving forward process. So you'll notice one little icon in the middle, and that's an interesting, we actually threw that in there as Power BI, right? And what does that really mean? It's because somebody might have said, okay, I've got this spreadsheet of data, and it's, you know, a million rows deep, right? I've maxed out what Excel can handle, let's say, and I'm doing pivot tables and I'm looking at all this data. But someone says, oh, I can download Power BI for free or download, you know, Tableau. And next thing you know, they build something visual, right? And people love it. And so this is kind of how that next transition of that wave into the data visualization space from a traditional reporting starts to take shape and we're actually going to focus on this in a moment on some of the live demonstration that we're going to de deliver but this is that impulse that says okay the users want data and see it a different way this is the first step in that transition so what happens next thing you know you've got spreadsheets that are populating all these visualizations and dashboards okay it's the easiest step because the business knows how they want to visualize the data they don't necessarily know how to do all this in a governed way, but they know they've already got the spreadsheet they've been using and delivering information to people on for years. And now they can basically take that and consume that right into a visual dashboard and start, you know, uh, turning the data into something a little bit more, I guess, user um, not friendly, but just more visually appealing to the business. Okay. So this is kind of where that evolution we talked about. And once people start getting a sense of what they can do with this data in a more visual representation, the 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 kind of the the use, or I didn't say the use of the spreadsheet, but the the means of the spreadsheet as your delivery tool starts to lessen. So this is actually, I think, are great things. This is a great solution for prototyping and getting people to kind of think outside the box and see see data in a new light. It doesn't fix the challenge of how to make sure that we've got the key issues that we need to address around performance and maintainability and governance, because that's obviously key <clears throat> for, for IT to be confident, everybody to be confident that data and decisions are being made um, in the right way. So what we all want is the easy button, right? Unfortunately for us, we live in a world that this is not, uh, or this is hard to come by, I should say, in the world of data and analytics and ERPs, right? Especially when you get into JD Edwards, as we know, because with the JD Edwards, the data doesn't sit in the database in a way that says, oh yeah, you can start making sense of that. Just connect to it and voila, it takes a lot of work to make that data usable to the business. And we'll talk about that as we go through today's demonstration as well. We want to point out a few things that are very important that we feel, because we hear this all the time, especially from IT, one of the biggest questions 
comes around security and governance. And part of it's probably because they've been dealing with that world of spreadsheets all over the place and users without them really knowing what's going on because once a user, even some kids, it might be a user takes a BI report that IT developed and they just export it to Excel every single month. Maybe it's five times a month and then they're manipulating that data in the spreadsheet. And so who really knows? So the governance there is that data being secured? Should, are people only seeing what they should see? And is there any standardization in, upon the metrics and the calculations that people are building in those spreadsheets? So governance is key to its performance. We all live in a world where our attention span seems to shrink every single minute, right? The days of, oh, you know, I run this report, it'll be done in 10 hours, I'll come in tomorrow, everything's perfect. That the uh, the world of business isn't isn't I guess as lackadaisical as that, and neither are anybody that we work with because people want information now. They want it available on any device, whether or not it's their mobile, they're out on in the field on a job site, or they're sitting in a boardroom and want to pull up on their screen or their iPad or or something. And so the data needs to be accessible very quickly and effectively and responsive. So people don't want to just, oh, I click on this and wait, you know, two minutes for that screen to, to finally refresh. They want it instantaneously. And so that's always becomes a challenge as your volumes of data grow, your data sources grow, and, and how to pull this together and make sure best practices are followed to leverage the technologies for what they're designed to do. Also scalable, right? We're talking right now, I've mentioned G.D. Edwards probably half a dozen times, but every customer that we deal with, even if they they come to us for quick launch for JD Edwards, there's always other sources of data. So the key is to, to, to kind of build solutions that will be scalable across your all the, the, the transaction systems that you may have or the different data sources um, outside of your ERP, but be consistent in the way that you access that, right? Because without that, if everybody is a different person that's that's bringing in data from a different source and, and have their own method, how do you manage that? How do you maintain that? Which leads to the last one, which is maintainability, right? So you want a methodology that's consistent across all the data because whether or not it's your internal team or your whatever resources that you're using to help you manage your data strategy, you want all development to be the same because not everybody that may be working with you today will be working with you tomorrow and you want that consistent approach so people can get in, know exactly how things are organized and know exactly how calculations are being um, you know, prepared. And you also want you know, a mechanism for education and growth. We'll talk a little bit more at the end about our, our customer success plan and our quick launch community to help provide that knowledge transfer to your team um, to make sure they're leveraging the best practices and make sure everybody's rowing the boat in, in the same direction. So these are the kind of four things, governance, performance, scalability, and maintainability. So now we talk about, and you probably heard this term in the world of data, single source of truth. Like, what does that really mean? You know, we also call this kind of the power of one. It's kind of the, the holy grail, right? How do we get and centralize our data into one unified centralized you know kind of data set where then analytics reports everything can be built from so the level of confidence and people are consistently getting the same value again an example of that might be we've got data coming in from other sources let's say jd edwards and looking at jd edwards sales we'll actually do this in demo in a minute maybe there's gross profit and gross profit has certain logic behind it. If gross profit is being calculated in 50 spreadsheets and 100 different reports, what is the odds of it always being calculated the same? I, my, my guess would be is the more places that business logic is repeated, the more points of failure this, and unfortunately from an IT perspective, people are forgiving, but only to a point, because once you lose their trust in the data, it's really hard to recover from that. And so that's why we all need to be very cautious about making IT and making your strategy a critical valued asset to the business and make it give you a competitive advantage. Has to have that confidence from the users about decisions they're making without 
the question mark of, I, is this right? Right. So there's got to be that level. And we'll talk about validation and other things, but really it's bringing this in, calculating gross profit one time, one place, managing that logic in one physical location. So without you using Power BI or you're using an Excel pivot table, pulling that same measure, that same KPI, that same value, and making sure you're going to get the same result. Right. Because that's the key. One, we call the power of one one data model some people would kind of call this the blue cube right this is that centralized data set using the microsoft technologies this would be a power bi data set and it's basically storing and compressing all this data in memory and then allows you to basically report on it from power bi paginated reports which is kind of that you know ssrs built within the power bi framework for those traditional reports we deliver those in a minute i'll explain about you know some income statements and balance sheets and then Excel, you can use that in a few different ways, and we'll kind of touch on that today as well. So this is kind of that conception of, this is like the holy grail, getting to this point of centralizing that data with some type of you know, data set. So what are we doing at Quick Launch and at Preferred Strategies with our Quick Launch solution? We have an option to go right at JD Edwards data and load that blue cube, so to speak, that in-memory data set. We also, for most customers, would mirror the data because they want to offload all their analytics purposes outside of the ERP itself. Most customers, if they've chosen Power BI, um, and Power BI lives within the Microsoft Azure framework, we actually put that optimized data store. We're gonna mirror the data from on-premise or one hosted cloud, could be in AWS, could be in you know, um, OCI, could be on-premise, wherever it is, and we're gonna basically mirror the data into the Azure, um, Cloud is a database there, and then we we basically are layering a suite of views on top of that data. To, because GD Edwards, as you know, the column names, the table names, F0006 is your business unit. Um, GBOBJ might be your object account, right? So there's the the table names and column names. The dates are all in the Julian format, the decimals, user-defined codes, right? All of these things are not, again, an intuitive, usable way. And then also, when you get larger sums, larger piece of data, if you have 300 million rows in your general ledger, last thing you want to do from a BI practice is load 300 million rows of data every single hour or every single you know, refresh. So you want to partition that. You want to strategically come up with a way to kind of incrementally load data into your, your model here. And that's kind of what we build into our solution. So to help that efficiency, because again, performance, um, and getting that data as accessible and as quickly as possible to the users is what's so key. We have sample Power BI reports and dashboards. Um, we also deliver an income statement and balance sheet mapped over an account hierarchy that is built into the model. So this blue cube, you know, we're covering probably around 150 tables from JD Edwards when this is uh, delivered for JD Edwards customers, about 200 relationships. We have what we call perspectives. So a perspective in some case might be there's an accounts payable perspective, an accounts receivable perspective. In the case of let's say inventory, there might be a few different perspectives. And really it's just a combination of tables traditionally organized by a module, let's say, or subject area. But it's where the, this, these, these relatable tables are already kind of, um, you know, make sense. And we've already vetted those out. So that's kind of where we can kind of talk a bit more about, about perspectives, but it's really thinking through, and, and even this, if we're supporting 15 different modules of JD Edwards into one data model, most companies don't think that far ahead. They might, as they get going with a, a strategy around data, is they'll create a sales mark, they'll create a GL mark and an AP mark. But a lot of customers want to be able to go cross module in their analysis. That makes it more complicated as you start separating those so what we've done is actually brought them all together and then relate them across. And I'll kind of point out in a minute what that looks like. So just to kind of recap, why is this important? If we separate the layers that we kind of showed visually on the last screen, on the left is we're going to prepare the data. We have to turn data into a usable format. We also introduce things like a calendar to be able to build the, you know, the performance of year over year, month over month type activity. But this is how we get the scalability and follow your strategy. Are you uh, looking for more things running on premise? 
you're looking at to push more and more things into the cloud is it a hybrid of that we basically work with all customers on their specific requirements to help sure we're actually um, architecting the solution in a way that's going to meet those those objectives the middle there this data model is kind of that another way of looking at that blue cube where we're relating all this data together this is how we get the governance the metrics governance and the confidence in the data we're centralizing business logic which again reduces the risk and maximizes user adoption okay and on the right you know we have these sample reports and sometimes we do a uh, a demonstration and say oh great you sell you know dashboards and really what we feel what we sell with quick launch is this in this data model the dashboard is just one representation of what you could do in that specific subject area um, from our, our our data model we'll talk about how we've actually rephrased this data model to be what we call our information engine in just a second oh there we go so with um, this quick launch information engine it's again people starting to 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 move the up the chain of a, their data maturity again getting from just living excel reports into data visualization you know it's bringing that data into that cube into that engine that is very robust and it's already thought through you know because sometimes users don't know the beginning of their report they start building it only to find out oh I also need this other field or oh I want to slice and dice it when I drill down I want to be able to drill down within the region to the sales rep I want to drill down within the sales rep to the products that are sold within that customer and so having an already robust model that's looking at and the ability to answer questions you haven't even asked yet is what's key and so we kind of look at this engine and the data is the really the fuel that feeds the engine it's the logic and the the methodology within the engine that's addressing the requirements of the customers to then feed out the ability for people to answer questions and make decisions on that data that's again fed from the engine is what leads to the competitive advantage okay and so really the one takeaway we'd want you to come away with today is how to centralize data into one unified data set or data model or engine so that way you have the confidence for people that are going to be building um reports from that. And I think one example, I'll leave it on this before we get into the live demonstration, is, you know, a lot of people, especially as you go up in the levels of management, if I'm a CFO and I ask the controller for some information, or I say, hey, can you get me this? And then the next day, all of a sudden my inbox, I've got this spreadsheet that shows up with the information I requested. I don't realize what it took the controller to go and prepare that, right? How much of those reports, maybe five different reports were exported and manipulated in a spreadsheet. Maybe there was macros, maybe there was all kinds of different things. How much of that within the filtering within the spreadsheet and everything else, finally get the result. What's my level of confidence? Now, as a CFO, I think it's great because I got what I asked for. But if we ask the controller, what's your level of confidence in what you had to prepare? would it be what you think, right? Would you, you know, I think we internally kind of thrown around this idea of, you know, you know, um, and Jill can kind of tell the story if her prior experience, but, you know, would you bet your paycheck on it, right? So this is where, you know, when you have a management looking at, um, you know, how confident are you with this specific piece of information? If you ask the control, would you bet your paycheck on it? You know, would they be willing to say, yeah, 100%, there's nothing wrong with the data I'm feeding you in a spreadsheet it's 100% accurate. I think that's the question that is you ask for information if you're a manager, in the back of your mind, you know, think about that, right? Because the key of all of this has to be confidence. You can't make decisions if you're not 100% confident in the information that's feeding the decision is, is correct. Okay, so off the soapbox for now. Um, we still have a few minutes to go, so we're gonna go ahead and switch over into some live demonstration. I'm going to start uh, here in a spreadsheet. So we kind of showed you that it looks very similar to the one you see here on the screen. So you probably have some fashion of this. This is actually, it happens to be over some sales sample data over JD Edwards. 
And you'll see here this spreadsheet, we've got region and sales rep and customer and product group. So this must have been some other report or query that someone said, just get me this into a spreadsheet and I'll do whatever I need from there. Okay. So my guess in some fashion, this is a probably fairly common occurrence. What would a lot of people be doing if you're, you know, on the business side and not as comfortable with something like, you know, Power BI just yet? They probably come in here, they grab this, you know, source of data, highlight it, and I go to insert, and I'm going to choose pivot table from this range, and I'm going to go ahead and choose OK. And now I've got a pivot table that allows me as a user and everybody on the phone, if you're coming from this, you know, business background using Excel, you probably could, um, you know, jump jump hoops uh, over me when it comes to this. But let's say I just want to see again by region, that's our sales by region, right? Maybe we want to go ahead and look at that by product group. So again, you can start building a pivot table. We can go format this. Maybe we want to see, you know, so this is being an example of, I've got a set of the data. I can now start organizing and drilling down on that data. I'm still limited to the details that are in this extract. And that's one of the challenges with Excel. I had to get the data into the spreadsheet to build the pivot table, right? So if this data is a very large set of data, or maybe I've got 10 different tabs all pulling different sources of data in the spreadsheet, all of a sudden this spreadsheet Excel file gets fairly large, right? So large sometimes where, okay, it's got to live just on our network because I can't save it to my desktop because it takes 20 minutes to save. Um, it just becomes this this beast of something that that becomes unmanageable. Now I don't know if you noticed when I chose insert and chose pivot table, right? I had this selected data. But what if I wanted to go up here and I said insert pivot table? But you'll notice there was another option here. I've got Power BI. I can connect to maybe an already governed data set out here. So if I were to go ahead and choose this. Right now, I'm going to go out there, connect to our already um, set of data, and I let's I want to grab, let's say, this sales model. Okay, so now I'm connecting from my Excel instead of going and having a whole subset of, of data exported to the spreadsheet. Here, we've already got I just one click, I connected to sales. Right, we actually have the breakdown of like things like the item branch. So your category codes, product group, product subgroup, product, you know, we go up to the customer, sold to, parent, ship to, right, channel, region, sales rep, all the address information. So we've already kind of, um, this is an example of our quick launch model for the sales perspective, but we also bring in a calendar, right? And the calendar allows you to slice and dice either in a lot of our customers that are heavy in sales might have a 445 or 544 or some unique calendar. So we we actually build out this calendar based on your fiscal day patterns. And then we use that calendar to calculate things. And in JD Edwards, you might have a sales amount, right? Extended price, month to date, quarter to date, year to date. These are dynamic that we'll build here together in a second. So we've already had these hundreds of measures and calculations of not just a specific thing like price and cost, we calculate gross profit. We also then calculate gross profit percent this year versus last year, this period versus last period. And we actually can go in and, and do things like, oh, here's on time in full. So if you're trying to get a sense of, you know, what is our ODIF um, and you're following those types of KPIs, you know, those are already done. So let's say that in this case, I wanted to look at, you know, gross profit, right? So if I want to look at maybe year to date gross profit, I'll drag that to our rows. So now what's happening, it's a little bit different. And I want to see that maybe by, again, product group. So if I go to our product group and drag that to our rows, and then we'll go back up like we did a minute ago, and let's look at maybe our region as our columns, okay? So now we could go in and, and say, oh, within the, the product group, now again, because any of these fields are another dimension you could drag into the rows and columns. So think about it. It's not just, okay, my spreadsheet had six columns I could actually slice and dice. Now we've got hundreds. Think of all the questions. You want to slice and dice any of this by any of these, these dimensions, it's right there at your fingertips to do so. So within the product group, maybe we want to go down to the product subgroup, right? Uh, maybe 
you know, within the region. We want to be able to drill down to the sales rep. So just dragging them in. Now you'll notice we did say year to date. And this is one thing that's a little bit unique. Once we bring in our calendar and I bring in, let's say a year period as a filter, this is where as a user, you're giving them the power to control that math or that, that calculation. So if I pick 2019 period nine, this is gonna calculate for 2019 period nine. Oh, but now I'm in the next month, 2019 period 10. And you'll notice how quickly it's updating with data, okay? If I were building this spreadsheet from this connection to the model, all of those hundreds of millions of rows are living inside of this in-memory data set that's already governed and centralized. This spreadsheet's kilobytes in size. I could open this up as another user. When I, let's say my colleague opens it up, it knows that my colleagues opening the spreadsheet authenticates based on their rights and only brings back based on their security what they should see, okay? So this is an example of using Excel in a more governed way. And that was just one quick example. Let me go ahead and show you Power BI because that is the one way that you can still get, and I'm bringing up Excel for the business, if they're living in Excel today and you're coming in saying, you need Power BI, you need Power BI, that's a tough because it's a whole new way of looking at data. They may not be ready for it yet. So in this case, you'll notice if I open up the Power BI desktop, I don't have any data. So the first thing someone might do is I'm gonna get data, grab this Excel spreadsheet, that we just did a minute ago, and now I've got this, and this is what a lot of people start their Power BI experience by pulling data from a spreadsheet, and there's nothing wrong with this for prototyping and getting someone to see what it looks like to visualize data, right? Because what Power BI does really well is saying, okay, I wanna see this data as a bar chart. So let's take a look here at what is our breakdown by customer and our sales. Right, so within a couple of clicks, we can drag that in and visualize that data, okay? I'm still limited, and now if I wanna go and build a gross profit calc, right, I can go new quick measure. It allows me to maybe build something like this. Power BI is a very strong tool. So let's say I wanna take my sales amount, less my cost, okay? So you could go in, again, I'm now, as a user, building a, a, a calculation that is now living within this one Power BI report. And so now if we bring this in, maybe into our chart here and bring in our sales amount down to our tooltip, now you'll notice this is now looking at gross profit and we can go ahead and format these, you know, you can, you can change all that. Again, like we talked about, this is one way to visualize data. I would encourage anybody that's living in spreadsheets to do what I just did, just to kind of start seeing data in a new light. But there's actually one more thing that we want to do. If we open up Power BI, and I'm just gonna do a new connection here, and instead of connecting, let's see here. So if I were to get data, and I'm gonna choose from, let's say analysis services, and you could grab, a, 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 your, your data models could live in a variety of different ways. And I'm gonna connect to this. Now I'm connecting to a perspective. In this case, let's say real quick, I want to get what are my open POs by supplier, right? Connect to the model. You might see general ledger sales, purchasing inventory, work orders, AP, AR. And if we grab, let's say, our purchase order, and I'm going to choose OK, it's now going to connect to this, that view of the model. So here on the right hand side, we'll look at, we're just looking at the purchasing. So if I go to our supplier, and I grab, let's say, you know, the supplier name. And now we're gonna go up here to our purchase order detail and look at our amount open, okay? Two clicks, we just basically connected to that. Here's our open amounts by supplier. We can then drill down to, okay, what items are we going to? Well, let's take a look at our item account and description. So if I bring that into the grid and make this maybe a matrix, Right, like a pivot table, right? I can then make this drillable. So we can see, okay, within Allen Supplies, these are the items that are there, right? So you can still use that data the same, or we could actually make that 
more you know visual of you know what's open right with a, a pie chart or a bar chart or, or what have you let's go back here for a moment i'm going to remove the item account so what's so powerful about thinking through all of this we connected to the model and grab purchasing you'll notice if i go on the left and click on this model we've got all these other tables across all these other subject areas all within quick launch across different modules that are already related behind the scenes we simplified the view for the the user but let's say that someone said okay i also need to know not just what's open for this by purchasing for this same supplier what about accounts payable? So how do we do that? Not the easiest thing to do if you're actually having to build this from scratch, but for us, we go to the right. Oh, one thing I want to point out when I was mousing over these, you'll notice it has the tooltip pop up. So we actually provide you the lineage back to all of those specific, you know, uh, column names so that, that people know, because they might say, oh, that just looks like a logical name. What's the source field that's coming from, from JD Edwards? And you'll notice the tooltip has that that lineage in it so let me go back here go to the right and choose view hidden because all of that's already related behind the scenes now we can go to accounts payable and ap amount and here's our ap amount open just drag it in so again within 15 seconds we just brought the open ap amount based on the same supplier as the purchasing so things like that. And we can build calculations across these. So I can say, okay, what percentage is our purchasing of our AP, right? Just like we showed you a minute ago, we can go in here and do new quick measures and build those, those calculations. We will do additional sessions where we focus on kind of what it takes to kind of build some of these models if you're doing it from scratch versus with quick launch in upcoming sessions. But before we, we end and wrap today, once you build your reports, you would then publish this to the Power BI cloud. And once it's published in the cloud, here's where you actually would then organize these. And this is an example of an app. Might have these different subject areas. Here's a dashboard within finance, right? Maybe we've got, here's a real quick look at some KPIs, whether or not, you know, here's our day's receivables. I can see I'm trending slightly down compared to last year. Here's that trend over time as an example. Maybe here's a GL, report right where we've got these different kpis from a gl perspective may want to analyze our expenses with the waterfall chart as you can kind of see so there's we can drill all the way down from these to the details we did a part of this in a session last uh, last month and then even that sales that we kind of started to, to build together here's a quick view of you know what's part of our out of box and we can kind of you know build some of this together in an upcoming session very quickly so this would be the way that once you're kind of delivering content, people are still secured, you make sure you have the right governance and the right process. So looking at the clock, just got a beep on my computer that says I'm out of time. So um, we really want to come back one more final slide and I'll pass it to Jill for questions. Okay. So again, I think what we like to just share is that the key is to have a plan and have a path to success. And one of the things that we do as part of our, we work very closely with you and your team, identifying your goals and what's going to define success for your project. And we work hand in hand, not just as a part of the, the initial rollout of Quick Launch, but also every month, every quarter from that point forward to make sure there's anything that that you're not doing to to leverage and maximize your potential for success we're here whenever you need us and we're here to help that momentum continue to to progress so jill back to you yeah thanks so much adam that was great information you know it's it's always so challenging right how to show uh such a very large comprehensive solution in a such a short period of time but I think um, what everybody could see is that depending on your maturity in using whether it's Excel or pivot tables, whether it's Power BI, um, that our solution really is super, super user friendly for the very beginning user who's just looking for dashboards, uh, reporting, KPIs, et cetera, um, all the way through to people who wanna be power users or bu building their own Power BI reports and also for departments who still have to 
um, have a lot of Excel reports, but want the data to be easily accessed and of course 100% true at all times. So um, thanks for showing that. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question, Adam, is how do you handle a heavily customized JD Edwards environment? Great question. So um, I guess the first thing would be, was what, depending on you know what is defining heavily customized, what we find all the time is companies use JD Edwards, some use it very vanilla, but most end up building F55 tables or tag files where they have additional things they need to bring in the fold, or there's other ex, uh, extra tables outside of the ERP that need to be brought in. We support all of that, and it's just a matter on the customization, so we can take that offline to, to determine, are we replacing one of our normal out-of-box tables with the F55 table? Are we bringing it in as an added table to the model? Are the customer doing that on their own, right? So none of these things that we're mentioning have to be done by preferred strategies, actually be done. We do the knowledge transfer so customers can do all of those things and customize it um, all on their own. Okay, great. Uh, then we have a question. How long does it take to connect our data um, to the solution and what resources are required from the customer side? Another good question. I didn't show any uh, implementation slides in this session, but we do have some. Be happy to share. Uh, we do the implementation is a 10 week process. It starts with really building out your infrastructure for a strategy like Power BI. Most companies that we work with, it's their first um, step in that direction. But because we do build out and part of our out of box content includes income statements and balance sheets, we need to work with finance to get the account hierarchy set up. Um, there's lots of different layers of the solution and lots of configuration that we're doing over the 10 weeks. And then the knowledge transfer at the end and data validation to make sure that customer agrees that it's matching everything that's coming out of the system. Um, as far as the resources go, we actually do have some slides that'll give it exactly which and what the time commitment is for those resources from the architects, from the analysts, from the financial subject matter experts, and so on, the project managers over the course of that. So I would be happy to, to share some of those if, if anybody's interested. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, uh, next question. What modules of JD Edwards does the Quick Launch solution support? Um, should pull up the list. The, the I think there's 15 that we do. So I'll see if I catch them. If not, I might miss a couple. So if anybody is curious, feel free to just pose. Um, we'll get a, a follow up with you. But general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, enterprise asset management. You know, even though GLAP and AR kind of all fall under the financial umbrella. In our calculation of modules, we consider them separate. You got sales, inventory, procurement, manufacturing, transportation, quality, HR payroll. I didn't mention this. We do separate HR payroll to a separate data model because the sensitive nature of that. Uh, we also have, um, let's see, uh, property management, uh, grower blend. Um, I'm missing some others, so I apologize. But yeah, we can get you the list. Um, but yeah, it's 15 different modules of GE Edwards that are currently supported uh, with a solution. Contract billing, job costs, or some others in the construction space as well. Okay, perfect. I was just going to throw in job costs and contract billing, and look, you remembered them at the last second. Um, another question, how many Power BI dashboards do we provide out of the box? That's another one. So um, as I the quick launch information engine we kind of look at centraling all centralizing all of this and it becomes this data engine that you can build any dashboard in seconds or minutes you can build any report based on that that content very quickly we do have samples for each perspective so a gl we'll have a gl report a lot of people look at that report and say that's a dashboard because it's got kpis and visualizations it's interactive you click on slicers and filters and but we're, we are, you know, those are included as part of the solution. We really feel the meat of what we're delivering is the engine. The dashboards we deliver are just icing on the cake, representing one view of that. So I would say by default, the answer would be, let's say on average, a, a dashboard per module. Um, some cases, those dashboards might have 10 different tabs on them, like in GL and sales, where there's a lot more going on than just maybe one page of a dashboard. but 
Um, but really it's it's meant to be a starting point, just like connecting the model and building something from scratch, like we did briefly with the open POs by supplier. You can basically build a dashboard the same way, just as quickly um, from the solution. Okay, and then one last question, and that is, um, do you honor JD Edwards business unit security within the solution? Yes, so we do have as part of our configuration um, an option there to do row security, we call it, or module slash row security. And some customers want that to be based 100% on their JD Edwards row security, whether that's business unit security or company security, and we can address that. Um, others might say we've got, you know, of the 100 users using the solution, 80 of them are in JD Edwards and have business unit security defined. So we want them to be applied that way. But we've got 20 executives that also are going to use a solution that don't even have a JD Edwards log on. How can we get them to have some level of row security as well? So maybe that's based on the divisions that they run and there's a category code. So we could get creative on doing a hybrid. But absolutely, the answer is yes. If you want to have people interact and, and the way that we authenticate within the Microsoft whole world here is with Active Directory. So because this is a cloud base with Power BI, Active Directory will sync with Azure Active Directory. And then what we're doing is it acknowledges as I log in based on my credentials I'm authenticating with, whatever business security should be applied to me is what gets restricted on my view. So that's what the beauty of it is if I only see and should only see business units one and seven, I only see one and seven. But Jill, let's say you have access to all business units. When you're viewing that same exact dashboard, all business units could return to your view when you're logged in versus only one and seven when I'm logged in. Okay, great. Um, I want to remind everybody who attended, um, also thank you so much for taking time to attend. But um, again, we'd love to talk with you show you exactly how the solution can help your organization. Every organization is different. Um, everybody's experiencing pains and hurdles, but they're all different, right? Everyone has different goals. Everyone wants to improve revenue and improve profitability, but in different ways. Um, you have different departments, different products, different issues. And so um, if you wanna take five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour to walk through the solution, have us show you specifically how our solution could help you, um, give us a call. Uh, send us an email at info at preferredstrategies.com. Go onto our website, search around. There's lots of resources, lots of good information there. Uh, but again, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, we will send um, the recording out of the webinar in the next probably two days. It's also going to be listed on our website if anyone wants to forward it to other people at your organization who weren't able to attend. But thank you so much for joining.